this presentation uh, right after lunch. If you are too tired from lunch and fall asleep, I'll just pretend you are too tired and not let my presentation is boring, okay? <laughs> so my idea here is to give you some, some ideas of how an emulator, how an emulator uh, works and if an emulator wants to to talk to the KVM, there are some kind of standard APIs that you need to call. There is a sequence pattern that you can call one API after another, another. So there is a sequence any program can do to execute guest code. You don't necessarily need to execute a fully complete operating system to execute some guest code inside the KVM. So I'll just give it, you uh, an overview of the steps, the workflow, and the APIs you can use. As well, um, other examples of KVM clients, programs that call KVM API, not only QEMU, Quick Emulator, so there are other tools that can make use of KVM API. So I'll talk about the workflow, some examples of the API, how you can write your own KVM client. I actually using an example code from uh, a guy that sent an article to Linux Weekly News. So it's Nothing new that I, I wrote myself. I'm, I'm just using his example in this presentation. So the, the workflow is pretty much simple. The program needs to open the KVM device. Usually it's a standard canonical path for slash dev slash KVM. I don't know if there are any distribution that places the KVM device on another path, so. And after obtaining the KVM API version, there are some really, really old implementations of KVM API since kernel 26 something, when KVM API was not stable, so they were bumping KVM API version very commonly. So there were some stabilization after that and this stabilization are until nowadays like 11 years. Uh, that, that's why some code needs to check uh, the version, then some extensions that the KVI provides, KVM provides, sorry. You create a virtual machine, allocate memory for the virtual machine, create a virtual CPU, initialize architecture-specific registers, and execute guest code until it is completely done in, in a loop, for example. So I, I tried my graphics skills and <laughs> created this workflow. It's pretty simple. You're gonna realize that there is a standard sequence of calls to the KVM, KVM API that any application can make use of. Open device, check for the version and extensions, create a virtual machine, allocate memory for the virtual machine, create a virtual CPU, initialize registers specific for each architecture, for example, on x86 example that I'm work that I'm showing in these slides, and for example, if you are running on another architecture like PowerPC, ARM, or any other architecture that supports KVM, you likely will need to initialize those registers with the reset state for the CPU, and it's pretty much specific to the architecture. And the, the last step that usually remains forever on a virtual machine life cycle is executing code using uh, an IOCTL, KVM run, 
This is the where most virtual machines live, and the emulator keeps going on a loop, executing, executing, executing. The age of KVM API. So it is started some releases before 2622, which was the last version the KVM API was bumped. And after that, they locked this as a stable API. Some people might disagree what stable means here, <laughs> but pretty much the, the API is the same and haven't changed since then. There were some additions, but the, the very basic core parts of the API were kept the same since then. So it's 11 years of stable API. On the kernel, there is this virt KVM, KVM man, which is the entry point for all the architectures that run in KVM. So if you want to look this code, how, how it works, it will be common for all the architectures on kernel. There is also a pretty large documentation. They call the definitive KVM API documentation. All API is documented there, or should be. <laughs> there are, from the time I was doing the slides, 120 something IOCTLs for, for the KVM. Those are pretty much the core KVM API, architecture specific API, so it's all documented in this file. They usually handle the IOCTLs. Um, they try to differentiate them like a system API, a virtual machine API, a vCPU API, and the device API. So an example of KVM system API, it's a, an API that changes the whole KVM subsystem, like creating a virtual machine on kernel. So when your program is calling this system API, it is basically changing the whole subsystem in the kernel, the state of the KVM in the kernel. The, IOCTLs for the VMs are basically handling virtual machines attributes. It does not change the whole KVM system state. So as well for the vCPU that these IOCTLs only change the virtual processor CPU in, in the KVM. So it does not affect the, the whole subsystem the, sa the same way the device API does not affect other things from the, from the KVM API. For the, the KVM client, you gonna realize that you don't need to emulate or run a complete operating system. You can make use of KVM isolation, hardware isolation, in your code, in your pre-assembled instructions, in your binary, without having to emulate a fully operating system. So you don't need actually to boot uh, another Linux machine to run some binaries isolated on, on, in a sandbox, for example. So you also don't need to emulate a full suite of hardware. So you can emulate only some pieces of hardware that you or your emulated code will need to, to do. There are some other KVM clients out there. So not sure if anyone has already heard about them. There is no VM, which is a hypervisor written in Go. And 
they try to keep the hypervisor very minimalist, only with a few steps to isolate the, the code being executed. So you don't need to boot a Linux to run a, a binary or something. Same way for KVM2, which is a very simple, lightweight KVM client that you can instantiate virtual machines, run guests on your Linux host. It's a nice tool, very lightweight. You, it's pretty straightforward. There are, there is Kata containers, which initiated by Intel as clear Linux, I guess. They basically execute every container or pod inside a guest. So it is so quick to instantiate a virtual machine that you can run all your container and pod workload inside a, a container inside a virtual machine. So for each container, it spawns a virtual machine, initializes all the registers and stuff. So basically it keeps more isolated the container from the host using KVM instructions from, from the hardware. This is the example I'm going to walk through this presentation. It is uh, an article from, from Linux Weekly News. It is from this gent, Josh Triplett. I'm just putting the license here, not sure if this is, I'm not a license expert, so since I'm gonna quote some, some snippets from him, I'm just putting here. In this example, it is uh, pretty much a very basic assembly instructions that you can add two values and print to a serial console output. This is a 16-bit uh, example. So this code array, you, you can do this like uh, you can build, compile your program with GCC or any other toolchain. And you can use, for example, object dump command to extract the, the array of uh, X uh, bytes so you can do an array and try your code yourself. So it's, it's pretty much basic here. It does an add to two numbers and then prints to an output, right? So the KVM test example starts by opening the device. So there are some standard functions like open. <laughs> Everyone here, <laughs> I guess, already used it. So you open the KVM device, and this KVM file descriptor you're going to save through the life cycle of your program. So you, you're going to keep track of this file descriptor unless the, the last reference of it is gone. The, the KVM, KVM structures on kernel side is going to remain alive. So since the, the last instance of this file descriptor is closed, all the kernel is going to release and free memory for, for the structures. Not a big deal here, right? <laughs> the first call to the KVM API is get API version. It does the communication to the KVM using IOCTL. Is anyone here that has any doubts about what an IOCTL is? Or it is basically a way that you can talk to a character device that you can write some specific commands. So each each API name here is actually a number that you write to, to the device 
And on kernel side, the device in interprets and do an action based on this number. Here is an example that it, the, the code checks for the, the return from the IOCTL. The get, the, the get version API, get API version returns the, guess what? <laughs> And it compares against 12, which was the last bumped number to the KVM. So this is, if, if it does match, it is a stable KVM host that your application is talking to. The next API call is to create VM, which affects the, the whole subsystem of KVM by creating uh, virtual machine structures on kernel. And this API returns a virtual machine file descriptor. So again, you do need to keep track of this virtual machine file descriptor unless you want to remain some <laughs> open references for your virtual machine alive in the kernel. It returns negative, which is uh, a common way for kernel APIs to, to show user space that something went wrong. So if it is not negative, not minus one, it succeeded. So the next step is to allocate memory for the virtual machine. The, the way the example do that is calling MEMAP, which is a call to allocate memory for, for, from user space that's going to be used on, on the virtual machine. So the user space needs to instantiate the virtual machine and then allocate memory for this virtual machine. That's how, in this example, it is doing that, calling MEMAP. Does check for memory allocation, and then it it, it just copy for another variable. No, nothing is going to be used in other examples here. This other API is set user memory region. This is uh, an instruct KVM user space memory region that you need to fill in and give the KVM subsystem as an input. That's why it is passing the region address to, to the IOCTL call. It will basically set where the user space memory is for that virtual machine. So that's why it is using here VM file descriptor and not the KVM file descriptor because this is affecting the virtual machine only. This struct is documented in kernel. Basically, you give the size and where the user space address is, which is a memory pointer that we just allocated memory from MEMAP. And then we create a virtual CPU Again, uh, this is very simple. It, it affects the virtual machine, so it is passing the virtual machine file descriptor to the IOCTL, and IOCTL is going to return the virtual CPU file descriptor that your application is going to interact with. Right? If it is negative, something went wrong. This other API is vCPU and map size. You can use it to grab and return the, the KVM size of the chunks that it can execute. And some virtual CPUs may have different sizes depending on the architecture is going to run. So you can do this to, to guess the, the size of the 
a map for the virtual CPU of the architecture you are running on. And then it, it allocates another region for the executed code, which is called here run. So again, you, you're instantiating more memory for the virtual machine that's going to be used for the virtual CPU to execute and place your code to, to be executed as a guest. There is this call, which is get special registers. This call is used to read from your host what are the, for example, CS register base selector, which is an x86 specific registers. So on other architectures like, like PowerPC, you can use this call to get the MSR, MSR register, which is the machine state register with all the parameters and the state for, for that vCPU. So you do this by passing the address of an instruct to the vCPU IOCTL and it's going to this is going to write, the IOCTL is going to write to this struct, so after that you can read and modify on user space. And in this example, it reads, changes CS base and selector, and then writes using the KVM set special regs to the vCPU. It is a very common pattern, this read, modify, write, so it's nothing new here. This is uh, an example of set regs that you can set the KVM registers, which is a common structure for the x86 to be, that needs to be initialized. So this will vary from architecture to architecture. So on x86, for example, it is set in the RIP, A and B are being instru in instructions. So, sorry, registers. <laughs> and then it calls the set regs, which is slightly different implementation of the special regs. So they, they share some some, co some common code. Again, uh, as you could see, there are some uh, patterns here. You call IOCTL, you check for errors, because if you go on on your code without make sure that all the calls return success, you, you, something can go south <laughs> with, with the emulation. And the last, but not least, part of the KVM client program is to actually execute and emulate all the necessary hardware or stuff that the virtual machine needs. In this example, it is pretty much a while one loop. So your virtual machine keeps running until it is completely halted by the KVM. So in this loop, we start calling the IOCTL KVM run to start running. And since we already called set reg, set memory region, and, and other calls to the KVM API, the KVM run knows where to look at in memory stack to, to understand where it will consume and execute all the guest code. So you keep doing this in a loop and every iteration in this loop, there will be 
an uh, exit reason uh, telling user space why the virtual machine emulation stopped. Because KVM can execute code, but there are some hardware that needs to be emulated. That, that's the, the part that QEMULE, for example, has a full suite of hardware emulator. The, the, there is a large number of KVM exit reasons that QEMULE needs to handle to fully emulate an operating system. In this example, it is a, there is a exit IO, which means that the code tried to access, write, or read from some devices. And in this case, it, it checks because we know beforehand that the instructions will try to write to a serial console port which is at this specific I.O. port address that we assembled before. So we check what kind of uh, exit I.O. that the KVM did, and we try to emulate. This emulation is pretty simple. We just grab what the KVM tried to write, and we call put chart to print in, in our terminal. So it's not a really advanced I.O., but it's a very simple example how the KVM run loop is going to, to be. So it keeps running, so it emulates KVM exit I.O. until there is a exit fail entry or internal error or the machine is halted, which is the, the default here. If you look, then I'll, I'll give some examples later. In QEMU, there are lots of exit reasons that is handled by QEMU. This example is out there. You can just compile and run. So it adds two and two from two registers and writes to serial output that we emulate as a output in our terminal. So it just prints four. <laughs> and here I ran this code with S trace to give you an idea of the sequence of the KVM API calls that the program did to emulate that code chunk of pre-assembled instructions. So it did KVM, get API version, create virtual machine, set user memory, create vCPU, CPU MMAP size, get special registers, set special registers, set registers, and then it took three passes to the KVM run loop to execute those byte array, so it, it, it didn't require too much of KVM. Here I'll give you some examples of real code in the wild, <laughs> how QEMU uses the KVM API. On QEMU, there are some separation for the IOCTLs they call KVM IOCTL for those CTLs that changes the whole KVM subsystem, like creating a virtual machine. And they do this by writing some wrappers functions, like KVM IOCTL, VM IOCTL, vCPU IOCTL, device IOCTL. So it, it, it's just a separation in how, in how it is handled by QEMU. So when, when you are reading and you see a KVM IOCTL, you're going to realize, oh, this, this call is going to affect the, the whole KVM subsystem. In this KVM init function, it does some sanity checks for the KVM API. This KVM API version 
that he tries to match is from kernel headers. So there is a directory on QEMU that all the kernel headers are copied from release to release. So these definitions are pretty much in sync with the Linux versions. This, this is still inside KVM init, which is create VM. It does some more checks, print error, check extension. If the machine, the host, is able to create devices, because depending on your KVM host, you might not have all the capabilities of KVM. So you might be able to run uh, uh, vCPU, but you are not able to create a device, for example. Create VM, uh, this is from uh, architecture specific example. It does all these calls in, in a sequence. Open the device, create VM, create vCPU. KVM destroy vCPU. Again, this call is used to get the MMAP size of the CPU, so it uses that to unmap the, mem the memory you allocated before. KVM run. There is this special KVM CPU exec, which is a thread function that's executed for every CPU, because you can have multiple CPUs on your virtual machine on QEMU. So this is a function that keeps executing, executing your code in the guest. This is the one that uh, is run in parallel. So as many as processors your virtual machine has, as many as the same instance of this function running as a POSIX thread on QEMU. KVM arc get registers. This is uh, architecture is specific. So the common code calls the KVM arc. So each architecture implements its own KVM arc, get registers function. Same thing for put registers, where you can write registers to the KVM. This is again a KVM architecture specific. So every architecture implements its own. This is from PowerPC, get one SPR, put one SPR. These are the references for the code links to the KVM test. You can go ahead and download and, and try yourself. Try to perhaps doing some very basic, uh, like this example, 2 plus 2 writes 4, so you, 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 you can keep going because this is really nice to understand that all programs that talks to the KVM needs to follow this sequence of steps. You're going to see no VM, KVM2, Kata containers, QEMU, they all do the same sequence but in different ways. So. I'd like to thank family, friends, and Gabriel for answering all my questions that I had through this process. <laughs> thank you. As Gustavo mentioned in the keynote, there is this Telegram group. And if you guys have any questions, say now, or there are some KVM experts in this room to answer my question. <laughs> Anyone? So thank you guys, I did appreciate it.